Great, so we are now live in the seventh session of the SDG Learning Center. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining in with this. We'll just pass the floor to our moderator for the session who will launch us off, uh, Ms. Tofflehorn. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. So uh, my name is, is Tove Holm and I come from the Baltic Sea Challenge and the Nordic Network for Sustainable Development at the Nordic Network for Adult Learning. And I would like to welcome you all to this special event of the SDG Learning Training and Practice Center on human rights education, global citizenship and transformative methods to accelerate uh, sustainable development and resilient recovery. And this session is organized by, by uh, five different organizations and or networks. And, and so the permanent mission of Denmark to the United Nations in New York and the Millennials Movement and the Baltic Sea Challenge and the Nordic Network for Sustainable Development at the Nordic Network for Adult Learning and the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And uh, we have divided this session into three parts. And the first will be held by the Baltic Sea Challenge in cooperation with this Nordic network, which, which I am presenting both. And then the second part uh, will be held by the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And there it's sign up um, uh, will be uh, hosting that part. You sign up just want to say hi. Hello everyone, and I look forward to talking more about human rights education later. So see you soon. Great. Thank you. And the third uh, session will be held by the millennial movement. And uh, Rosaria is at least here. So do you just want to say hi to everyone? Hello. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me. I'm very glad to be with you and very eager to see and be with you during the session. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, next, uh, if you have any questions or, or comments, please add them to the chat. So then we can pick them up, up from there. And, and yes. So uh, now I give the floor to my colleague, Brita, and you can, Lea, take the next slide, please. Thank you, Tova, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brita Puti, and I'm in the Nordic Network uh, on Adult Education together with Tova Holm. Um, and we uh, have especially focus on global citizenship and transformative methods um, towards then a more sustainable uh, world, which is what we want. Um, so in this session, um, we're going to have a brief presentation, uh, but then we'll like to involve you with some questions and exercises. Um, so actually already now you can start to think about if there's any good news world, uh, worldwide or local um, regarding sustainability uh, projects or news that you can think of. We'll get back to it, but just you can start to think of if you have any in mind. Um, I'm, I'm from uh, Norway, part in this uh, network, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about who we are. Uh, but you can start, to give me the next slide, please. So, <clears throat> as you, as Torve said, we are two networks that are cooperating for this uh, part one of the session. Um, so the one is a Nordic uh, network, as you can see the circle around the, that part of the world. Um, Nor Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, uh, and so forth. And then we have the other network with the Baltic Sea uh, Challenge, which you can see in, in red here, the Baltic Sea. So in this part of the world, um, I mean, reports have shown that in terms of the sustainable development goals, um, these countries rank relatively high in terms of international measurements. And, and how far we've gone, uh, but there's still many challenges that we deal with as well in this part of the world. Um, some, uh, especially concerning the consumption and also uh, emissions uh, that are very high, uh, if you look at the population and, and the, the, so the sort of climate related. But then uh, we're also very also concerned about the social economic um, 
dimension of sustainability. Uh, so if you take the next slide, please, you can talk a little bit about the Nordic Networks for Sustainable Development, uh, focusing on adult education, both formal and non-formal. Um, so here we are uh, looking at all three dimensions of sustainable development. And this network was established about 10 years ago and uh, is under actually the Nordic Councils of Ministers. Um, and this and, uh, network is a sort of falls under a bigger network, but this one focusing on sustainable development. And you can see some keywords that we put up here. Um, we believe in cross-sectorial cooperation and cross-disciplinary learning. Um, so that, you know, it's a holistic approach looking at the complexity. And we adopted uh, the word called pracademic, uh, combining the practical and the academic work. Uh, we like very much working in that um, uh, approach. And uh, uh, of course, that inquires uh, democratic participation, uh, learning by doing, and with the we're now working, focusing on adult education, we have a lifelong learning uh, perspective on what we do. Just to give a few examples of what we've done in this group, like we meet uh, regularly every month, but we have arranged um, during the COVID, of course, there are more web webinars, but we've also had, uh, um, we're lucky to get a, a, a educational model that we applied where the participants came from all different sectors and we met in each in four, four meetings in different Nordic countries to learn about both practices, but also theories around uh, education for sustainable development. I think that's, yeah, that's what we can say about the network. We'll send you the website later, but uh, Tova, um, you can talk about the, the Baltic Sea challenge, please. Yeah, so next slide, please. So, so the Baltic Sea Challenge, uh, well, in 2007, the mayors of two of the biggest cities in Finland, Helsinki and Turku, uh, they had, were concerned about the state of the Baltic Sea, which is really eutrophicated. And they also thought that healthy waters also uh, will, will affect on the competitiveness and welfare of the cities. And so uh, the first joint action plan of, for the Baltic Sea of the cities of Helsinki and Turku was launched in, in 2007. And, and it's an action plan what these two cities are doing for the Baltic Sea. But then the mayors also understood that it's not enough what, what the two cities will do, but it's very important to engage as many as possible. So they also decided that it's, it will be an open network that anyone can join that wants to work uh, for a clean, productive and shared Baltic Sea. So, so anyone can actually join and, and mention some concrete action they are doing at local level uh, for the Baltic Sea. So we work within the cities and of course in, in the cities we are in and nationally and internationally. And at the moment we have about 320 organizations who have joined and about uh, two thirds are from Finland and, and one third are from the other countries around the Baltic Sea. So we have nine different countries and about 85 million people living in this, in this area, in the Baltic Sea area. And so I would say that engagement and participation is in, in focus in our work. And then you can take next slide, please. And Brita again. Thank you. <clears throat> so as I said in the introduction, like our focus um, for this part one is the global citizenship and transformative learning. And um, we, uh, sort of follow this uh, thinking that we find with Freire and, and Klafki that if you learn about issues, it has to be issues that matters for the participants. And, and we think that, you know, you are local somewhere around in the world and in our case in the Nordic region, um, but you're also part of the bigger world as we know. Um, so I think this global citizenship it needs to come uh, be with us in, in thinking and approaches that we have to learning about sustainable issues. And uh, um, I heard it in Swedish first time, this word of global, combining the local and the global. 
So you might do or address or um, make take initiatives that are local, but has maybe a global impact as well. And then we also like to focus on the systemic versus the individual change that is needed for a more sustainable world. And uh, we like to work on uh, both these levels. So we like to challenge our own attitudes and our own behavior towards the more sustainable ways, working with, uh, in this case, an adult, um, uh, within adult education. But then um, we also need uh, it to lift it up on a higher level. Uh, on a more political uh, scale. So we like to work on the whole uh, specter there. So if you can please take the next slide, we'll give you one example of what we mean about this. Um, I didn't say it in, in the introduction, but like in this network, we all represent different sort of organizations or institutes. Um, and I work with the Norwegian folk high schools. Um, I can go on about that, but it's a it's a one year boarding school, no exams, no grades, where you go in depth learning about the subject. And mostly the students are around 19, 20 years old. And here is an example of a, a folk high school in the western part of Norway, uh, who were very much engaged in topics such as environmental care and and um, uh, transformation. So here was a, a small group of students who saw that in Norway we have infrastructure for railway. Uh, but it could be even better uh, so that we could avoid the huge distances that people travel by plane, uh, domestic, uh, or by, by car. So they wanted to contact the Minister of Transportation at the time, and he happened to actually come from the island where this school is based. Um, and to strengthen the case, if you press one more time, then they made a, um, um, a petition to... Um, if you can take the next slide or there will be a new picture appearing, please. Thank you. So here was a, um, a petition that they had uh, for, uh, they were a small group of people, but they got other youth involved or anyone aged. So they got about two, 3,000 uh, signatures uh, for a better railway uh, offer in Norway. And they were lucky to have a meeting with the Minister of uh, Transportation because of COVID, they couldn't meet in person, but you can see him on the screen here. Um, and if you take the uh, press one more time on next slide, it will come another picture up. Um, he uh, wrote to them after the meeting and were really happy. They were really uh, uh, pol young politicians themselves uh, to, to get to the case, to the point that they wanted to show. And one uh, idea they had was to have an interrail ticket. We have that in Europe where you can buy one ticket and travel all over Europe but they wanted to have that in Norway so that more people will choose uh, the train instead of a plane. And if you press one last time, uh, you can see that a few months uh, later, he went to the news media, this minister, and said that they are now going to investigate from his ministry, uh, looking into can they offer such a ticket in Norway. And this shows, you know, these students are working on a very practical level in their school, making small decisions, you know, in, in more sustainable ways that they, they work in all kinds of ways, learning to fix clothes or, you know, throw in the garbage the right way or whatever, smaller things. But then they also lifted it up on a higher systemic level in, in addressing this issue, it, what the local uh, sort of problem that they saw, but it has a global impact because of their missions. So that's one example of how you can work within, this is non-formal adult education and how you can work on on different levels and the global and the local and the systemic and the individual. Then back to you, Tova, with another, yes. exe another example. And next slide, please. Yeah, so here are some pictures from, from our work. And this is how I work within the city of, of Turku, where I'm trying to get, engage as many organizations as possible uh, uh, for the work for the Baltic Sea. And so the first picture, you can see that I usually organized it, this workshop in the beginning of the year. And here are, I apply this circle methodology that we have actually also applied in this Nordic network. And in short, it's about that everyone checks in and then we, we, we make the development and everyone checks out in the end. So 
everyone uh, participates regardless of their title or or their position at their work so so everyone's voice is heard to say in short so i organized this this workshop in the winter and then we have uh, for for a few years for three years we have had three different events during the summer uh, one of them is focused on uh, security of the sea and environmental aspects. And, and the other one, the, the Baltic Sea Day, is more about the, the cultural aspects of the Baltic Sea, but of course also the environmental. And then we also had this beach cleaning event uh, together with divers uh, organized also, where of course it's about littering, which is in, in focus. And, and so uh, this, this workshop that I arrange, it's open for anyone to join. And, and then, of course, many organizations are joining all these days, but, but, but some are joining maybe just one. And, and, but my main point is that, that when different NGOs, they all have their own stakeholders and then they communicate. We, we for example, have many musicians who, who join, so they, they communicate to their stakeholders about their uh, kind of using their words and their methodology to, to communicate uh, about uh, protecting the Baltic Sea. So it's a lot about, there are like about 30 different organizations in, in these different uh, uh, events, but this beach cleaning, there's maybe 10 organizations joining. But anyway, so, so all these who are participating are, are communicating in their way to their stakeholders. So I, I believe that that's, that's how we can get more people uh, joining by, by getting this because, I mean, I communicate in my way, but the jazz musician uh, communicate in his way and a researcher in his way. And, and then, uh, for example, here in the middle is the mayor of the city of Turku, uh, between the two divers and of course she's a politician so she communicates in her way so so it's 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 kind of communicating that that get different uh, organizations involved in in this work so it's again about engagement and and participation yeah but we were thinking that now you have heard two two examples of of kind of good news or or ways to enhance sustainable development so now we would like to hear uh, uh, or, or get examples of, of good news from you. And if I get the next slide, please. And then I give the word to Natalie. Yeah, hello to everyone. So I uh, ask you to um, think of some good news you have heard and then look for the news link. And after that, I, I copied a Padlet link to the chat box where you can uh, go to the Padlet. And then I ask you to copy paste your uh, link to the Padlet uh, by cl uh, clicking the red plus on the right upper corner and then follow the instructions. So then after we all put our links there, we can see many good news all around the world. And maybe, um, Lea, could you go to the Padlet so we can see the links we are getting? Thank you. Yeah, so first, it can be any, any good news, something that you have heard, it can be from your region or, or I don't know, from globally or, or something. And then, then you copy that. And then you see there in the right upper corner that, that pink plus. So there you can add it. And it can be in any language, doesn't matter what the news is. Yeah, and I can see some some of you have copied the link to the chat, uh, chat box. I can add it to the map. Thank you for that. We are, of course, also interested from where you come. So please, 
please add something so then we see see how how from which all countries we have participants at the same time we already have an example from canada and iceland and two from finland i think we have added them before <laughs> Maybe we put the link to the Padlet again in the chat, or is it easy to find? Yes, I have yeah. now shared, and I'm sorry, maybe it was first to some direct message to somebody, but now I think it's to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Iceland shop is in Britain. Okay. This is also an example of, of how we usually work, that we try to, to, to present different examples because we, we believe that different people listen to different, uh, well, uh, how would I say, um, different organization. And it's, it's important to have, have different uh, uh, examples from, from different regions. Mm -hmm. And we, we believe that we, we get sort of bad news a lot every time we open any news media. Uh, and it's important to bring up the good news about all the things that are happening that gives us hope and motivation to continue uh, the work that we do. Yeah, so if you're searching for the link to the Padlet, it's in, in the chat from, from Natalie. So there, there you can see it if you didn't catch it. It's also great that you're sharing, sharing your news in, in the chat. So, so that's also a, a possibility to find them there. Okay, but this is, this is kind of one way that, that we usually work, that we, that we try to lift up also the positive, positive news. I actually saw a news about climate change and, and there was a, a media consultant that they interviewed that he mentioned that there are so many you know, negative news that for every negative news, there should be three positive news to try to, to, to enhance something. So, so I think this is, this is something we all, we all can do. We, we can try to, to share when we are doing something for enhancing sustainable development. Um, if Leah, I can ask you to, to show the PowerPoint again. And uh, the next slide, please. So now we are using another media. So I would like you to, to all take your phone, which I'm guessing it's, is there next on your table, and, and then go to www.menti.com. So you just Google menti.com. I'll do it at the same, so, so I'll see that it works. menti.com, yeah. And then you put in the code uh, that you see there on the screen, 55043071. And then if you can click just one layer, so then we will see the first question. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, in your region, what is the most crucial sustainability issue. So we would like you to answer, answer this question.
uh, yes, so so I would like you to go uh, to to uh, if you Google menti.com, you go to the address www.menti.com, and then you use the code five five zero four three zero seven one, and and when you put the code, you see the same question as you see here on the on the screen. Uh, it asks uh, in your region, what's the most crucial sustainability issue? And it asks for one, one word. So then you can write here what you think, your uh, opinion on what is the most crucial sustainability issue in, in your uh, region. And uh, I know that you are still answering because I see that this is, is uh, living, but I suggest, Leah, that if you stop screen sharing, then I can share the, the, the results from Mentimeter. So uh, here you can see it's, it's still living, but, but we have there in the in the middle, we have climate change, pollution, water, peace, and plastic waste. Yes, you can. What do you, Brita, think about? These are the same issues in, in Norway. I had to even think for myself now because I, I thought about the climate issue. I mean, Norway is known for the oil production, uh, but then, like we said in the report, also there's uh, the consumerism is way too high. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, here now in the session, we're lucky to have people from all over the world. I just saw in the chat, uh, so it shows also how diverse it is. I mean, the scale will also differ. It might be that we meet same um, similar issues but in a different ways uh, also depending if we're living in urban or rural areas and so forth um, yeah good and education is mentioned women development uh, occupation also on, on the social economical side of it yeah i think we'll go to the next question so i'll just go one forward here so now if you have your phone open still it it shows another question and it asks in your experience which methods engage people in sustainability issues so the question is about how which methods it can be something that you have heard about or something that you apply yourself so please, you can enter one, two, or three words. And, and we think this is an interesting question because, I mean, uh, I don't see you all who are participating here, but I know you have extensive experience in, in the field and, and, and knowledge about this. So it's very interesting to hear from you uh, what you think. And, and like Tove said, we, we like to uh, work in uh, using active participation from the people that we engage with. And then we know there are challenges here because we want to engage even more and in better ways. So which ways can we uh, yeah, manage this? Yeah, here again, we think it's important to share 
that it's very important to share methodologies because I think that we all have the same agenda. We want to enhance sustainable development and we want to work for the SDGs. And, and we have some methodology that, that's working, that we are applying. But, but if we would share more, this is also about the good news that if we share more how we have actually worked with this, then we can learn from, from each other. It's not possible right here, but, but this is maybe the message we want to, 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 to uh, address. Great. We still have one more question, so, so I, will, I will go to that. So Okay. So the next we didn't have a, a third question. Yeah. I at we least not okay. do you have it in or because we wanted to ask about the possibilities. Yeah, yeah, I don't see it here. So if I can go back to, to the, the PowerPoint, please. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> if Leah, you can uh, share the PowerPoint again, please. And next slide, please. Yes. Why is it that so question? Yeah. Yeah, so here are, are some, some information uh, about, uh, so the Nordic Network for Adult Education and the Baltic Sea Challenge, here, here are the websites. Uh, we can also put them in the chat uh, afterwards. And uh, um, please uh, stay in contact uh, if you want to cooperate. We want to cooperate with you all. We want to, to enhance sustainable development and, 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 and work for, for these issues. And, and we really um, appreciate that, that you, you participated in, in some, some of this. We tried to have some kind of, it's, it's not easy to, to have a discussion about among 134 participants, but, but this was a, a try and also a way to, to show an example of how you can maybe engage uh, uh, more, more people globally at the same time. So I would like to, to thank for, for my part and would you, Brita, still like to say something? Yeah, no, I, I'll join you on that one. It was really nice to present to you and, and, and hear from you. I'll, I'm looking forward to looking more into what you sent in uh, afterwards. Uh, and, and I see in the chat also that there's a huge experience in, in all of you who are here. So I'm very grateful to be here. Um, thank you. Yeah, so thank you. And, and then I'll give the floor to sign up. Great. I'm just trying to share my screen. There goes. Sorry. Yes. So good morning again, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's joined us today from all over the world. My name is Zainab Samar, and I work with the Danish Institute for Human Rights, which is Denmark's national human rights institution. I work in the international area of the Institute in the Department for Human Rights and Development, where we work on shaping and monitoring the SDGs from a human rights perspective. And among other themes, we work on human rights education. We're very pleased to be here today at this important session, underscoring innovation and developments in various aspects of SDG 4, for realizing the acceleration of sustainable development and a resilient recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic started as a health crisis, but very quickly evolved into a multi-dimensional crisis affecting all walks of our social, economic, and political life with particularly severe consequences on already marginalized and discriminated groups. In many ways, the pandemic simply cast a magnifying glass on existing structural problems that our society simply masked and ignored for decades. 
but which boast, burst forth in the face of a prolonged borderless virus. Some of the questions we face as we continue to grapple with new variants and aftershocks and repairing the damage done, while at the same time trying to get back on course and delivering on the 2030 agenda are, number one, how are we better prepared in the future? How, do we, how can we be better prepared in the future? And secondly, what sort of data should we be demanding as citizens from policymakers as an evidence base for smarter, more people-centered policy decisions in the future? Human rights education is not only an essential element of SDG 4 on inclusive and quality education, but also a vital tool for current and future generations to hold a mirror up to society, powered by the language of human rights and its accountability mechanisms. An investment in human rights education is essential to foster a future resilience and to understand the consequences of structural inequalities and demand their redress by duty bearers. Sorry, I can hear an echo. Can someone has them? better now. Second, we must depend on human rights-based data to inform policy decisions and ensure that we do not merely depend on data that depicts averages such as GDP rates. We must look at the individuals behind the averages. In the next half hour, we'll zoom in on human rights education, SDG target 4.7 and start with a bird's eye view on human rights education as laid out in the Global UN World Programme for Human Rights Education. We'll hear first from Ms. Paulina Tandiono from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She'll help us understand what we mean by human rights education, how it's defined, how it's operationalized through the successive phases of the UN World Programme for Human Rights Education that her office coordinates with a focus on the current fourth phase of the World Programme on Human Rights Education that focuses on youth. We'll then move on to a more granular level and gain an overview of the monitoring of human rights education through a demonstration of the Danish Institute for Human Rights, SDG 4.7 Human Rights Education Monitoring Tool, which is quite a mouthful, but it's a very good tool, I promise, and you'll see as we go along. Underscoring the centrality of data, particularly human rights-based data, as we recover from COVID as a global community and look towards building our common resilience and addressing the structural elements, in this case, education, that we as a global community lean on under regular circumstances and even more so in times of fragility. The demonstration of the monitoring tool will be followed by two country case studies, one from Ghana and one from Palestine, both of whom have used the monitoring tool and based on emerging data, undertake a decisive evidence-informed decisions on advising their governments on how to strengthen the implementation of human rights education in their countries. For this, we're joined by Ms. Nana Amuaseki from the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice in Ghana, and by Ms. Hiba Farid from the Independent Commission for Human Rights in Palestine, both of which are the national human rights institutions from their respective countries. So a very warm welcome to the panelists. Thank you very much for being here. And to the audience, please uh, ask any questions through the chat functions. We'd like to be as interactive as possible and raise your hand if you have a question. So now to continue with the program, I hand over to Paulina without further ado. Paulina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zainab. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Okay, thanks, Zainab. Um, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, participants or colleagues, uh, wherever you are. Um, as Zainab mentioned, my name is Paulina. I work at the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And thank you very much for the Danish Institute uh, for Human Rights for the kind invitation to speak at uh, this uh, important um, event. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I'm hoping to um, set the scene on um, human rights education, so to say. I would provide um, a very brief overview on, on, on what human rights education is, as well as uh, what the World Programme for Human Rights Education is, focusing on the, its current phase, the fourth phase, dedicated to youth. Um, next, sign up. So, next, please. Okay, so this is pretty much the structure of my um, presentation. Uh, next, please, sign up. Um, now, 
what is human rights education? Um, for some, it may be quite apparent, but just to make sure that we are all on the same page, um, I would like to um, um, explain a bit what is human rights education, what does it seek to achieve, right? So human rights education has its basis in international um, human rights framework. It is first and foremost based on the most important document setting the standards for human rights, the UDHR. Now you can see this is uh, some relevant uh, provision from UDHR. And of course, provisions on human rights education have also been incorporated into many other international uh, instruments and documents, right? Um, for example, uh, the ICESER, International Covenant on um, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Convention Against Torture, CEDAW, uh, on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against um, Women, CRC, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and, and et cetera. Now, in 2011, um, the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training was adopted. So this is really uh, a specific instrument dedicated to human rights education and training, and it spelled out the intrinsic attributes of human rights education, as you can see on the screen. It is, um, however, important to note uh, at this stage that um, human rights education may have different labels. We, we can call it education on non-discrimination. We can call it education on respect for uh, diversity. Um, but for us, as long as the goal of the education is to build a universal culture of human rights, um, as the definition uh, is shown on the screen, that is human rights education. And these two documents are, um, as well as those in the other international treaties, are not the only milestones indicating international commitment towards human rights education. In 2004, the General Assembly proclaimed a global initiative focusing on um, strengthening the implementation of human rights education at a national level, which is what we call as the World Program for Human Rights Education. Next slide, please. Now, the World Programme for Human Rights Education is um, structured in five, uh, five year consecutive phases. You can see on the screen, for example, the first phase from 2005 to 2009, focus on human rights education in a primary and secondary school system. And then second phase, uh, higher education and then educators, civil servants, law enforcement officials, military personnel. And then the third phase is to strengthen the first two phases, as well as human rights training for media professional and journalists. And finally, here we are now, uh, the current fourth phase from 2020 to 2024, dedicated to human rights education for, with, and uh, by youth. Next slide, please. Um, in just a little bit of context on the fourth phase of the World Programme, uh, back in to, uh, 2018, the, in its 39th session, the Human Rights Council decided to make youth the focus group of uh, the work program and to align the fourth phase with target 4.7 specifically of the SDGs. And in response to this resolution, um, our office, OHCHR, drafted uh, a plan of action in consultation with numerous stakeholders, including member states, UN entities, other regional and international organizations, NHRIs, and civil societies, including youth-led organizations. And we drafted the plan of action in, in consultation with all these stakeholders. Um, just a little bit of context, the plan of action is um, a, guiding, a guidance document uh, containing step-by-step -step guidance on how to um, implement, how to strengthen implementation of um, human rights education. And um, in September 2019, um, finally, the Human Rights Council adopted uh, the plan of action without a vote, and it, it did enjoy a broad support from a lot of member states with um, over 50 states uh, co-sponsoring. Next, please. So, uh, as I mentioned, the plan of action um, is, uh, you know, it provides a comprehensive human rights education strategy for youth at the national level, which can and should be adapted to national context. And it provides four components for an effective human rights education for, with and by youth, which can also be used to assess uh, progress in this area. So, um, the first one will be policies. 
what kind of policies would be helpful for human rights education for youth. Uh, we, we, we recommend that states enact policies and legislation ensuring the inclusion of human rights education in formal education. And then on non-formal education, states shall also develop policies and measures facilitating the work of civil society. And then for the second one, teaching and learning processes and tools. The plan of action um, did specifically uh, mention that human rights education should not stop at ensuring that people know about human rights. It must also build their skills and shape the behavior of young people so that they can claim their rights and um, defend the rights of others. This component also talks about the methodology that should be employed. Uh, methodology that is learner-centered gender sensitive, experiential, and peer-to-peer, -peer, which are um, methodologies that have been uh, proven to work, especially with young people. The third uh, component is on tr the training of educators. Of course, since teachers and ed educators, other teaching personnel, hold major role and responsibility in, in uh, conducting human rights education. They are the frontliners in close contact with children and youth. And the final component would be an enabling environment, um, which means wherever human rights education and training takes place, it is important that government provides safe spaces, that government ensure youth have access to um, human rights education and training and government guarantee freedom from reprisals to those conducting or participating in HRVT. And in all of these stages, um, it is important that young people be the key partners. Next slide, please. So ultimately, um, human rights education is about implementation at the national level with support from international um, cooperation. Now, um, as part of this process this year in 2022, states are submitting a midterm progress report to OHCHR on their implementation of the fourth phase of the world program so far. So what, what they have been doing in, in the past two and a half years on human rights education for youth. And we are currently in the midst of uh, compiling the inputs and we will submit them to the human rights Council in September session this year. So stay tuned for um, those of you who are interested in what states have been doing in this, in this area. Maybe one thing that I wanted to um, mention um, in this uh, while talking about the world program is that we OECHR, we have been presenting to the Human Rights Council the evaluation reports. Uh, of the previous three phases of the world program, where states have reported uh, how they have put in place systemic human rights education strategies in line with the world program guidance, uh, which in include policies, training of education, personnel, um, curricula, textbook, uh, methodology, etc. But uh, one thing that we realize is that from the reports, uh, we realize that we rely on uneven reporting practices from states and, and very often on like anecdotal evidence in terms of um, capturing progress in the area of human rights education. So we, we, we do think that there is a need for a more solid methodology for the international community to be able to collect and share advancements and good practice, of course, with a view to uh, inspiring um, more action more effective action, so to say. So to, to contribute to, to these national and global needs, since early 2018, OHCHR has been supporting the work of the Danish Institute in the conceptualization and development of a human rights education indicator, indicator framework uh, to provide a series of common objective and data-based um, indicators, which hopefully will not only assist implementation of the work program, but also goal four on quality education of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, particularly start, um, target 4.7. And I believe you will hear more about the tool from the next um, speakers. So allow me to conclude my intervention by quoting our um, UN Secretary General's report on our common agenda that quality education is a foundation for tolerance, peace, human rights, and sustainable development. Therefore, investing in quality education, which includes as an integral, integral part human rights education, is a cost-effective way to um, drive economic and social development, to improve skills and opportunities, including for young people, 
to unlock progress towards uh, sustainable development goals and to leave no one behind. So um, should you need further information on the work program, please do not hesitate to uh, reach out to us at ohhr-wphre at um, un.org. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing uh, the next speakers on the tool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paulina. So now we have a clear definition of human rights education and how it's being implemented globally through the UN World Programme and also about its monitoring at the Human Rights Council. We now move on to looking at uh, the tool that I mentioned earlier, the SDG 4.7 Human Rights uh, Education Monitoring Tool. So SDG 4.7 sets a target for states to enhance education in human rights, gender equality, peace and non-violence as a means for building sustainable and equitable societies. I, I will now be demonstrating a monitoring uh, tool to monitor progress on the implementation specifically of the human rights education aspects of SDG 4.7. So as you see before you, this is what the landing page of the tool looks like. And in the chat, I'll share with you a link to the tool and some of the data from the tool that you can uh, flip around with and see if you find it useful. Uh, so data collection through this tool is digital, it's user-friendly and guidance is provided along the way. The tool is relevant for assessing progress on human rights education at the national level. It can be used by state bodies such as ministries of education, by national human rights institutions and also by civil society. Here you see what the tool is based on, the methodologies that we employed in formulating the tool. And as Paulina mentioned earlier, it's been very closely developed with OHCHR, the indicator framework behind the tool. The questions within the tool have been developed with OHCHR. So there are two levels at which the tool was developed. We have the human rights instruments, which you can see here to the left that pertain to human rights education specifically. And we've taken guidance from those instruments on formulating the indicators within the tool. And on the other side, we've taken uh, guidance also from the two most uh, globally accepted frameworks on human rights education, which is the UN World Programme for Human Rights Education and SDG 4.7. So combining these two frameworks is how we came with the indicators for the, behind the tool. And here you see an example of what I talked about earlier what makes the monitoring and data generated from the tool rights-based. This slide gives a good overview of a process of infusing various elements of a policy or a framework with granular human rights-based context or standards. So if you see here, this is one of the indicators within the tool, and it refers to a category outlined in SDG 4.7, which assesses a curricula, how strong the curricula is in terms of human rights education. And here you see how we take standards from specific human rights instruments, the general comments and specific articles. Here it's the Convention on the Rights of the Child and how we use this granular level detail on human rights to inform this indicator, to check the effectiveness of human rights education in the curricula, where you move past just a framework and you infuse it with detail. In this slide, this is just to give you an idea. I don't know how many of you have been able to access the link, but if you look at the slide here, this is basically the tool consists of two angles. Uh, one is how the, da the data is entered through questionnaire, which you see to your left. There are 23 questions in the questionnaire and they respond to the framework provided by SDG 4.7 in the World Program. And then to the right is the data processing capacity of the tool, which then converts this data in a visual format. And the final report summarizes and visualizes the data per country and provides an overall score based on an index calculation developed by our statistician colleagues at OHCHR and the Danish Institute. So the final report helps in gaining a systematic and comprehensive overview of the current implementation of human rights education in a particular country context, and it helps to identify gaps and where there's room for improvement in national implementation. On this slide, you can see how if many different countries, as is the case with the tool, once they've um, entered their data into the tool, you could do a comparison of the various domains of data, for example, policy, teacher, education, curricula, and then you assess it against the different countries included. So in our experience, we've seen that such data visualizations are eye-openers. 
and then they are also strategic conversation starters where you can have peer exchange between countries that maybe if a particular country is lacking in terms of policy in human rights education and another country is quite strong it opens the doors for peer exchange on how to strengthen the implementation of particular aspects of human rights education from one context to another So here you can see the value of the indicators and of this tool, of course, only resides in the use stakeholders make of it. And currently the tool is in use in 16 countries globally. These are the countries where it has been used so far. And without further ado, normally my next slide, I talk about some of the good practices or the achievements that have come out from the countries that use the tool. But it's a pleasure today that we have partners present with us today from Ghana and Palestine, and I'm going to give them the floor to speak on their follow-up actions from having used the tool. So now, without further ado, I hand over to Nana Amnaseki from the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice in Ghana to tell us about their experiences in using the morning tool and follow-up actions based on the data provided by the tool to influence curriculum reform in Ghana. Nana, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Zainab. Thank you very much, Zainab. So, um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Very well. In um, October 2020, we administered the tool, and these are the outcomes of the research that we, we, we had. If you if you realize when you look at the learning environment, there's nothing there. There's nothing recorded there. That was due to lack of documentation. And also, um, when you look at the policy, when you look at the upper primary, which is the color blue, the upper secondary, sorry, then the primary, which is the orangish color, and the lower secondary, you realize that the figures are slightly different. Why the, there's not enough policy on primary schools, I hesitate to answer that question. But coming back to the teacher education, you would realize that in upper secondary, compared to the primary and the lower secondary, that is relatively low. And that is because most students at that time have zeroed in into the courses that they want. Either they want to do general arts, or they want to do business, or they want to do science or visual arts. So the teachers are trained in that particular area, those core subjects are not human rights per se. Can we go to the next slide, please? When we got the data, what we did was to form a national technical committee drawn from all stakeholders, like GES, Ministry of Education. We had NATS on board and the um, assessment, the curriculum, those who do the assessment and curriculum for the, gov uh, for the country. And they came out with these broad outlines, which we call the National Action Plan. Can we go to the next slide, please? So with this- Sorry, no, no, sorry to interrupt. National We're Action Plan, of, uh, we zeroed in on the uh, curriculum uh, reform. Yes, in Ghana, when you look at the, um, graph, the earlier graph in the first slide, you realize that the curriculum, we had quite a high number, but then and there are snippets in the various subjects, especially in social studies. And that is not our aim as a human rights institution. What our vision is to have a culture of human rights established in Ghana. And the main way we can do that is to ensure that human, the human rights education it's a standalone and not found in little, little subjects scattered all around. And that is why we zero it, despite the fact that the very high number there, we zero it in and say, we need to have a standalone, human rights education as a standalone subject where we can bring all the children on board. And it won't just because what we had been doing previously was to have it in the various integrity clubs or human rights clubs. And that one is optional. Children who don't come into the clubs will learn virtually nothing about human rights. And that is why we said we need to have this as a standalone. So what we did, 
after the national committee gave us the broad outlines was to fill in those broad outlines starting from the kg that is the kindergarten to the senior high schools so this is an extract of what we did at the basic level that is from the kg the kindergarten to jss3 we know, taking into consideration the ages of the children at the various levels, that it was going to be a progressive um, uh, system. So, are the are the are the cake? But then, when you look at the content of the HRE, we talked about the definition. We looked at the meaning. We looked at the nature. We looked at the characteristics and the scope of specific rights. What we did was to shop around, sit behind our computers and shop around. Look at other kind of what we shoot us in Ghana here. So what we, we did was like the right to life. Initially what we knew was just right to life, but going into the general comments, looking at what was there in, in the international level, we realized that it is life, survival, and we had to get the titles right and a copy of our report. It will tell you more. After all, and that, when you come to the secondary level, we added a little bit more. So you find the duty bearer. What is the duty? Who is the duty bearer? Who is the rights holder? What does the United Nations Human Rights System? What is the law all about? As Africans, we needed to go into the African Charter. Let the children know what is in the African Charter. Then coming back to human rights and corruption, what are the linkages? Because that will give the practical examples for the children that if I'm given money to construct a hospital, an A-grade hospital, and I construct a B-grade hospital, then someone's right to life is being hindered. So these are the practical examples, and that is why we brought human rights and corruption for the older children to understand the practicalities and be able to, it won't just be an abstract subjects but then they'll be they'll related to the what is on the ground so lastly what we have done is that the curriculum framework has been completed and validated as far back uh, i think two years ago and then what we have done is to engage the minister though not fully because when we initially started we engaged him and the director general of education to tell him what we intended to do but with COVID coming in and the schools going on break for a whole year, we've kind of have stopped. And so we need to get that done and get it out of the way so that the Minister of Education can present that cabinet when he is convinced that we have done a good job and that it needs to be incorporated into the curriculum going forward. What in the meantime we have done is to have questionnaires developed for baseline study of human rights and integrity clubs to identify and amend the gaps. But that was one of the things that came up under the um, National Action Plan. So we've gotten that developed. We are waiting to uh, validate it. And by the close of the year, send it to all our offices nationwide so that they can bring in the results. And then through that, we can revamp our guidelines and then get human rights club working and maybe more attractive to the children because we have uh, in our questionnaires we are going to question the children and see what will make it more attractive for them to be able to join as we wait for the curriculum to to be on board and everybody join because as we said we don't want to leave anybody behind and we do want a national human rights culture established in Ghana. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you for this very concrete overview of how data can point to specific gaps and hopefully lead to policy level follow-up actions. And in this case, you've given us a very concrete example of how you can influence curriculum reform at national level. I now hand over to Hiba from the Independent Commission on Human Rights from Palestine to tell us a little bit about how they use data from the Human Rights Education Monitoring Tool to start a strategic dialogue with the Ministry of Education and engage with them in a plan for committing to strengthening human rights education nationally through a series of policy measures. Hiva, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. 
Um, um, I'm presenting the experience of ICHR, the uh, Independent Commission for Human Rights in Palestine, uh, using the uh, as a monitoring tool for human rights education. As, uh, and as you can see, uh, the tool recorded 86%. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm, I'm going to discuss the processes that the ICHR went through um, uh, in cooperation with the Ministry of Education. At the beginning, we, um, when uh, the IHR uh, suggested uh, using the tool, we investigated all approaches uh, suitable to um, uh, work uh, uh, and cooperate with the Ministry of Education. And we thought that uh, having a memorandum of understanding is going to be the best uh, a cooperation uh, method. Uh, we signed uh, a memorandum of understanding between uh, our general director and the minister of uh, minister of education, and we selected point persons from the minister of education and as well as the uh, uh, ICHR, and we started the uh, discussion of the implementation of the tool. Next slide, please. I think one of the successful points or the 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 best experience uh, best practices uh, we can conclude that uh, appointing point persons facilitate everything uh, uh, minister of educate uh, of education should uh, full cooperation with us. Uh, we examined, uh, um, they, they were uh, um, uh, interested in examining the level of education and humorous education in the Palestinian educational system. Uh, um, uh, the assistant uh, uh, undersecretary for the educational affair in the ministry uh, was involved in all the process. He discussed with us in depth uh, the indicators, the availability of the, um, in, uh, the data on the national level, the mechanism of uh, collecting and applying uh, all the information collected. And uh, the Ministry of Education created a WhatsApp group uh, for the uh, 4.7 national team. And I think this is the second uh, good practice we conducted. Uh, we were supported the, the, through, through the whole process by uh, DIHR and Zainab. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, we were working in a very tight uh, time frame. Uh, we started the process in November and we had to finalize everything in December. Uh, so we conducted um, an, uh, um, a kickoff meeting. Then we have a comprehensive uh, uh, full two days meeting where uh, we um, named the departments and the uh, units from the Ministry of Education who are responsible for providing uh, uh, the data uh, and we agreed that ICHR is going to uh, be the data entry for the um, uh, mining tool. Uh, we conducted a disseminate, uh, um, um, ICHR received the first draft of the uh, full data in the 15th of December. We reviewed, reviewed the data and the verification uh, methods. We had the several meetings as um, you know, the verification weren't corrected all the time. Uh, this um, uh, uh, requested the Ministry of Education to review um, a, a, a good extent of the, its, that, um, uh, its website, especially uh, for uh, the published documents. And uh, uh, finally, we uh, uh, agreed on the uh, data entered and the um, report extracted from the database. Uh, we had a dissemination workshop that was covered by major news channels and newspaper in Palestine. And we had a meeting, a, a comprehensive meeting uh, between ICHR and Ministry of Education to discuss our future plan to promote education, uh, human rights education in Palestine. Next slide, please. Um, in the right corner you are column, you are going to see the um, um, uh, um, future blends. And on the left one, you are going to see the major outcome. One of the major outcomes that we open internal discussion between ICHR and the Ministry of Education in relation to the human rights education in Palestine, especially related, those related to data availability and data collection. Uh, we had the boosted trust between us, and we also boosted cooperation between us in um, using ICHR surveys, especially for one of the indicators uh, uh, filled in the monitoring tool. 
For the future plan, ICHR included uh, the findings of the 4.7 report within its human rights situation in Palestine annual report at the uh, National Human Rights Institution in Palestine. Uh, the Department of Training, Awareness Raising and Advocacy, in coordination with the Ministry of Education, launched a series of training and awareness raising workshops dedicated to boost and promote uh, um, the awareness of uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, education. Also, the um, head of the Palestinian SDG national team uh, um, informed ICHR that he, the state is going to adopt the indicat indicator value on the national level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have learned a lot uh, through the short uh, um, uh, 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 framework experience, but we learned that uh, uh, we need to uh, contextualize the tool uh, to um, maybe cope better with the Palestinian context. Uh, uh, the engagement and enthusiastic of senior management is very important to the, to the success of the monitoring tool. The appointment of the point persons from both uh, sides is very crucial. Also, the WhatsApp group facilitate the data collection process, and we overcome obstacles very quickly, as you can see from the uh, um, uh, comprehensive uh, two days workshop till the date, uh, ICHR received the full uh, the data. Uh, it took only one week. Uh, also, uh, it uh, um, uh, uh, proved the uh, role, uh, the important role of the National Human Rights Institution as a national data provider and validator. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 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 the recommendation that we came up with the uh, Ministry of Education uh, was on the state level that uh, uh, the state of Palestine should develop its comprehensive human rights national uh, plan. Uh, also, uh, we have to, um, uh, uh, the Ministry of Education is going to ask the uh, Ministry of Finance to have a clear budget lines for human rights educa education programs. Also, uh, they are going to request uh, 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 the Ministry of Interior uh, to include the, the Ministry of Education within all the periodical uh, international obligation report, especially those related to human rights education. Uh, also, uh, they are going to request the State of Palestine to ratify some of the international um, uh, conventions related to human rights education, and they ask the, uh, the support of ICHR in this regard. Next slide, please. On the Ministry of Education level, uh, they, are, they are planning to conduct a research study uh, to measure the Ministry of Education staff, especially teacher, principals, and counselors, counselor knowledge of some of the concepts that they came in the monitoring tool um, to uh, uh, maybe increase the, the percentage, the fulfillment percentage of the tool for the coming years. They also would like to conduct research studies on students' knowledge of human rights concepts. They are going to uh, include the concepts of human rights education within the national test guidelines which is not existed uh, right now. Also, they are going to establish and revisit uh, continuously the electronic human rights library for educational material on human rights. And they are going to, uh, both of us, the Ministry of Education and ICHR, disseminated the finding of the tool through a printable uh, uh, flyer or um, small, small bo booklet that we already uh, printed and uh, disseminated within um, uh, uh, Palestine nationally and some of the international uh, UN organization as a soft copy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva, for that insightful presentation. And as I can see, we're running out of time. So I'm just going to be very quick and leave you with two main messages that we were hoping to transmit through this session here. One is that there's an urgent need for investing in education, particularly a comprehensive education that includes human rights as a means for fostering social cohesion, promoting solidarity and building a just, peaceful, equitable future based on a common understanding of human rights. To put this statement into context, there's a statistic that's quite alarming that in 2020 alone, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, more than 168 million students lost access to almost all in-person learning. So that's the first issue. The second issue that we wanted to highlight was that 
the fact that data is political and data informs policy decisions that impact us all. Government and policy makers the world over rely on data. However, more often than not, this data serves the advancement of narrow political and economic goals. It focuses on broad national averages and it renders communities of and groups of people unrepresentative in the numbers. And these are often the people who are the most discriminated against in any case. And this in turn leads to policies that do not respond to people-centered needs. So by ensuring that SDG data serves the advancement of human rights and meets the goal to leave no one behind, we hope to empower rights holders to seek their rights and hold duty bearers accountable for their actions by introducing more people-centered data sets that can in, uh, influence policy and future direction. So that's it for us. And I hand over now to Rosario. Thank you everyone for listening and for tuning in. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello everyone. Thank you for being in the event and thank you for, for all the presentations to the other co-organizer organizations. Um, Today, we had a presentation of the regional um, office of UNESCO in Santiago. Unfortunately, uh, the representative Christian Bravo is not able to, 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 to join because he had some, um, and, uh, some uh, an emergency back in Chile, so he was not able to join. But we are going to share with you some of the processes that we went with the Office of UNESCO Santiago regarding uh, youth engagement on consultations uh, around the SDG 4, and specifically the, uh, the target uh, point four seven education on global citizenship. And also uh, we are gonna share as well some about the, uh, the process and youth consultations with um, the, the High Commissioner of Human Rights regarding education on human rights. So as we, as you, can, as you have seen in, in the previous presentations, um, the education process on human rights is, is pivotal if we want to achieve the 2030 agenda. And mostly um, if we see, if, or if we want to um, keep the program, uh, keep the process going even after 2030. Um, fortunately, the 2030 agenda, and uh, when we talk about um, sustainable development, we are basing this on the Declaration of Human Rights. So there needs to be an interconnection between those thematics. So I'm gonna show you um, just a little bit of these consultations that we went through with the Office of UNESCO Santiago um, as part of the process for youth engagement, um, but also to, 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 to facilitate that young people is part of the decision making and is also part of the recommendations that are sent to member states in different spaces. Um, with the support of the, or with the facilitation of the Office of UNESCO in Santiago and different youth networks, we were able to um, not only engage young people from the Latin American and the Caribbean region in processes where we uh, get to know what is going on in their, in their communities regarding education, how they are handling uh, education on the digital era and how they are moving forward in order to um, keep learning and keep uh, working on um, having uh, these educational processes or being able to access to these educational processes. But not only that, this consultation that was in the frame of uh, intergovernmental process where we were sending the recommendations issued or generated by young people to member states include as well a process where young people from different countries in the region were able to identify what they were looking for uh, when, whenever we talk about education in the digital era and what are the main challenges. And some of the information that we were able to gather during this process was very related, at least in this regional consultation, to uh, the security of young people whenever they are working or, or they are um, interacting on their educational arena. So what do, what do I mean by this? Whenever young people in the region are um, going from schools to 
uh, from their homes to schools, but also how this translates whenever it's online. You know, they struggle with different uh, situations such as bullying, but also situations where they are um, vulnerable or they are put in a situation of risk. So how do we organize or how do we create the measures for young people to be safe whenever they are uh, participating in the educational processes or whenever they are working or they are interacting on the digital arena in educational processes um, regarding um, global citizenship, but also in the regular uh, education processes. So this is one of the processes and one of the, uh, and going beyond perhaps the explanation and how was this, consult or what was this consultation about? Some of the um, main um, things that were integrated on this um, call, uh, process call it with youth um, and uh, UN regional offices such as the UNESCO Santiago um, is that um, young people were included from the beginning on the planning, on the consultation, also as facilitators of the consultation, um, at, at helping with the systematization of the process as well. So there was um, a, a real inclusion on uh, regarding youth uh, whenever this process of or these consultations were planned and actually was one of the uh, one of the first regions that was able to engage directly with young people from the beginning of the consultation. So some of the main things that um, I think can really help on these processes whenever we are talking about how then we go from the actions, from the monitoring to now taking the space on this decision-making, uh, the decision-making processes with member states um, through these kind of consultations, it's very important that uh, the UN offices are um, open to discuss and generate and collaborate uh, as we did with, uh, with the Office of UNESCO, um, these kind of um, youth engagement processes. But this is not the only experience uh, we, we went through. Also, we have an experience with um, another uh, consultation whenever we engage young people uh, was related to the, uh, to, to the education above all initiative that is um, current, um, co-facilitated or colleagued by the um, uh, Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, Philatech and Education Above All campaign, um, where different young people joined the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in order to um, uh, deliver or facilitate a global consultation with different young people across the world where they were able to tell us about um, their challenges regarding uh, human rights, but also what they were looking for, what, how they will see policies being taken in place, what they needed in order to um, have access or, or have access to tools to advocate for their rights. So some of uh, this is mostly the regional process. Um, this, is, this was very interesting because then again, um, the UN officers were very open and were very, um, um, uh, they have a very youth friendly space where the, the global office in Geneva was able to connect young people with, uh, in some cases, regional offices, but in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean region, we work mostly with the office in Guatemala, and they were the ones that um, uh, kind of facilitated or co-facilitated the process with the young people that you see here. We have Cecilia Garces from the Guatemalan Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. And these consultations as well, they were from the beginning, they engaged young people um, on the elaboration of the consultations, on the identification of the activists in the region. So, and, and then with the facilitation of the session itself, um, not only this was taken in place, but also an online survey took place at the same time. So the participants on the process were able to share not only what were their challenges and what were they expecting, but also good practices that they have seen or they have organized with uh, their peers in, in their communities in the, or in the region um, around um, the protection of human rights and education about human rights. So um, 
And then what, what is going to happen next? Because something that is important is that whenever we see these kind of processes and tools that take place in order to escalate the voices of younger generations to decision makers is that with this information, um, we, uh, we are working or we are supporting the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights to create a toolkit, a toolkit that is going to be available and is going to be launched in September um, for young people across the world to be able to access to information, to um, uh, like relevant information, but also tools so they can advocate for their rights in their communities, considering different um, situations and different contexts um, about youth across the world. Um, these consultations that we run with them also help us to understand the context because when we were able to see like global results, perhaps the responses were a little bit different. And then when we were able to de-escalate the process to regional level, and in some cases, even to the national level, we were able to see that perhaps the challenges that we see can be different for young people across the world whenever they think about education and human rights or whenever they um, try to understand how their human rights are being vulnerated. So these are two processes that um, uh, engage uh, young people um, on, on, uh, from the beginning, not only uh, as people who's consulted, but as partners, as key partners that were able to um, help to shape the, uh, these consultations. Um, but most of all that are contributing with what we are um, looking for to achieve when we talk about the SDG4 and the target 4.7, that is education about a sustainable development, global citizenship, human rights, um, and how young people can be able to be part, you know, of the new policies that will be pushing these processes in formal education, but in also non-formal education spaces. So, um, um, these are um, two consultations. And finally, um, something that I wanted to, to bring to you is that, um, so for these two processes, we were part, uh, we, were, uh, we were able to be part of the processes. And then I really thank Paulina and also George from the, uh, from the team of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights that actually were here as well at the beginning of the session. So I really, really thank you for, for joining the session. Um, but at the same time, or finally, I'm gonna try to share with you um, also how this education and sustainable development can take place in the ground from youth or for uh, um, uh, uh, promoted for youth uh, or from youth uh, by youth. So let me just start sharing my screen again so I can share with you um, this last initiative. So at the beginning of the call, we were covering a little bit um, this um, segment about the consultations that were run with, um, with youth in the Latin American and the Caribbean region um, around education on um, global citizenship um, for the global, uh, in the, on the digital era, but also um, we were seeing a little bit about the consultations on the process um, of education above all um, about education and human rights. But now um, let's go, let's de-escalate the process from the consultations at the regional level to actually the ground and see the work that young people is doing. So I am want to quickly present you this presentation about the uh, ambassadors program and um, the 2030 agenda citizen ambassadors program this is an initiative called by different organizations um, that is focused on the latin american and caribbean region and is um, this is also a way that or that you can see um, that young people is also activating and perhaps it's a it's a very good example for you to to perhaps think on young people or youth led organizations in the different regions as partners um, that are, are in, capable to, to contribute with the efforts towards the SDG4. So this initiative is a civil society initiative from youth by, for youth by youth, and the, it aims to empower that accompanying uh, the, the young people on the implementation of the SDGs, and it takes six months. One of the main things of 
of this of this activity is the training part. The training part is not only focus on what is or what are the SDGs, but is actually focus on how the organized youth, the youth led organizations, can take these approaches of sustainability, of education, and human rights, and incorporate them in their organizations so they can deliver projects uh, focusing on different areas, you know, uh, gender equality, climate change, education, thinking around or having this framework um, uh, of education and human rights, global citizenship, um, and um, education on um, uh, sustainable development. So the, this process or these activities not only include climate change, inclusion, um, global citizenship and partnership, but also it includes some actions in the territories. So I don't want to um, go beyond time, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, here we have um, uh, some, of the, some of the training sessions. The training sessions were co-facilitated with the support of UN offices at the regional level. We, here we have in this picture, the ECLAC office, the UN Economic Commission of the United Nations. So here we see the importance of the support of the UN um, for uh, um, uh, programs or spaces or processes co-lead co by young people. So in this specific process, the, um, it really, um, or the approach, that the regional UN offices are having in order to be open and contribute and collaborate and support youth-led efforts um, is pivotal because then we are sure that the message that needs to be delivered is right and that the young people are learning from experts, are learning, are, are knowing the data that is being generated about themselves and how they can keep contributing with, this, uh, with the implementation of the 2030 Agenda going from the base of education of sustainable development. So um, we are gonna go now, oh, sorry. Um, and then the program has some activities. So, and this is um, the de-escalation of the program itself. So whenever we work on this educational um, process regarding education and sustainable development that also include this education on global citizenship and on human rights, for these youth led organizations in the region, then the organizations themselves are able to go to the community and start implementing actions with these approaches. So this is um, this last part of the presentation um, that was actually our, our part for the, for the session. Um, it's uh, in order to share with you how we can go from, you know, like these um, regional uh, consultative processes where young people uh, like us, gather and, and engage with the United Nations, um, in, in our case at the regional level, in order to bring our voices around the SDG4 um, and also our recommendations uh, uh, and in a for informal spaces. But then now how also young people can be part of the actual implementation of the, or action for, or around the, the the SDG4, the target um, 4.7. So these are some of the, uh, the uh, this is the information we wanted to share with you and we are very glad and we hope that these processes can help you and also um, guide you uh, perhaps in, in, in future activities. And we are very uh, thank thankful for the um, UN regional offices that are always supporting us and also the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights that was uh, very open on including young people on this consultations um, delivered this year. So thank you very much. And then I look forward to hear from your questions. And, and yes, thank you. Okay, so we have a here's some messages we are gonna see on the chat. So I give the floor to 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 uh, continue with the session. Thank you, thank you, Rosario. So now we still have a, a, about 10 minutes time. So, so, so please 
ask you can ask any any one of us questions and i'm i'm looking at the question and answered some some are answered there in the uh, by writing so you can go to question and answers and then then click on answered and there you can find some answers to 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 some questions and then i see that maria de filippis uh, you have asked um to share your work so would you love like to to share and and uh i don't know how how to give Do you have a possibility to to uh, start your video and unmute yourself? I'm guessing not. Okay. Okay. I see that all the questions have been answered there. So now I will check the chat. Ah, attendees may now may not share the video. Okay, thank you, Leah. So, have you, Zainab or Rosario, noticed any question that you would like to answer? How do you? Yes, Rosaria. Yes. Thank you. So, you mean the question on the Q and A section? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about if you have noticed something in the chat or in the Q and A that that oh. we would have possibility now to answer live. Yes. Um. Actually, uh, there were some questions about um how you can join the processes. For sure, um, regarding the education for all, I'm gonna drop on the chat box, the link of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and the process of education for all, so you can know about the information. And regarding the UNESCO process, uh, what I have, uh, what I know is that they are, we are still systematizing, the, the UNESCO regional offices is still systematizing the, the, the <coughs> Sorry, the reports on the consultation. So it's going to be available on their website of the Santiago office. But definitely, um, I'm writing my email on the bottom uh, on the chat as well, so you can so you can um, write to us and we, we can send you the information as soon as it is available. Regarding the 2030 Agenda Ambassadors Program, of course, it's a program that um, starts every year from the middle uh, in the second semester of the year, and definitely we are always uh, it's focused on the Latin American and Caribbean region uh, for uh, youth led organizations. But definitely, if you want to know more about it, if you want some materials, we always can share the materials. If you want to um, deliver something similar in your community or in your country, we we are eager to share information. So also write to us so we can we can share that um, with you. Um, and yes, and definitely here, now that we still have a lot of participants, um, I thank you all for your messages and so on. And definitely, I, I invite you to engage young people on these processes because it's, more, it's very important that um, the the work around the SDG four and mo uh, mostly the target of four point four point seven is intergenerational and young people can be part of the process as partners. As you can see, we can be a very good partners. Um, and um, and yeah, definitely, I think um, it 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 will be a great experience for you as well. So yes, thank you, Doug. Thank you. Uh, I see that someone has asked about the, the actual schedule and you can find it in the, the chat, all 2022 SDG learning training and practice sessions. So you can find it there. And there I see a question. Here is one who is asking, hi, Isabel is asking, hi, I am a primary school special education teacher. What would you recommend I do with my students to help make this information accessible to them mm. could you maybe rosario answer this sure 
Um, thank you very much. Well, there is actually uh, amazing tools that have been created for professors. Uh, we use them with uh, the 2030 Agenda Ambassadors Program, and they are created by um, the world largest lesson is Project Everyone. So I just shared with you the information about the Youth Advisory Board that I was telling you that um, supported the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights on these consultations for education for all um, about education of human uh, and human rights. Um, and then the world largest lesson, it's an amazing tool that we use. Um, um, and what we really like about it is that this initiative has created even the the working plans for each session so it's not that you need to create um you know or go from the scratch and you know and create your own materials actually they have them all and they cover different sdgs so you can bring this information to them so i just put also the um, the, the link on the bottom. So that's the world largest lesson. And then if you are a professor, you can always sign up and get trainings over there as well and use the materials in order to facilitate this information to, to young people. And it's very youth friendly. It's, and you have um, um, sessions for people even from six years old till 16. And it's something we use for our programs. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's really great. I noticed that um, I'm familiar with Teams and not with Zoom, but but if you click on that three dots, then in the right down corner there, you can save the chat. So so if you haven't been able to take all the links, <laughs> it's it's possible through that that uh, uh, to do it. Now I'll just check the question and answers again. Um, Here's one question. Could you please indicate how a student or any person can join SDGs to create a project supporting them? I'm not an NGO, I'm just a student, but I want to start a company to support SDGs 2030. Should I? No, yes, please. Or, I... Oh, or, or I don't know if sign up also or other person want to. Do you have a sign up? answer to this go ahead Rosario. oh okay well um something that is important is that you don't need to be enrolled in a program or in an organization if you are a young person or a new student that want to take uh, some actions about sdgs it's very easy like um i suggest you to check the world largest lesson um link that i just shared i can reshare it on the on the chat so you can check the information there first. It's very important that we also educate ourselves so we can understand the logic of the SDGs. But there are other different programs such as the uh, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable Development um, Network, SDSN, uh, Young uh, Youth. Uh, this is a network that work with young people and even they have some, some programs for young people that want to bring the SDGs to their universities. Um, we are um, members of, of their global network. So it's something that is working as well if you are an individual that want to join. But definitely, I would encourage you to check for information online, but also educate yourself and start um, with this process by, you know, um, taking yourself these actions that are needed, right? Um, if we are if, if we are talking about education and sustainable development and human rights, perhaps thinking how we can change these day in day to day actions that can start not only um, supporting the, the the main goal or the big goal of the what is the SDG four, but also that can help you to uh, to to to. Uh, start transforming your own environment. And I'm pretty sure more young people is going to be able or is going to be willing to join you if they see that you're doing something um, uh, as well. So that's what happened to us. But definitely, I will also uh, um, share the link of the SDSN Youth Network so you can also join uh, those spaces for youth action. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.
I see that that our time is running out, and I also see that you you cannot save the chat. I'm sorry about. I, <laughs> I'm not familiar with Zoom, so <laughs> I'm just learning myself here. But do you sign up? Still have something you would like to bring up from from this session? Sorry, yeah, I think I'm okay actually. Tove, I've shared my email address on the chat, and I'm happy to take up follow up questions and have more in depth conversations with particular participants who are, for example, I see someone from Nigeria who's interested in hearing more. And we do have experiences from Nigeria on human rights education, but I'm not sure that the question is addressed to me. So I think it's just easier if there's something particular on human rights education that they reach out to us individually by email, and then we can follow up with proper conversations. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. I also put my email in the great. chat. So, Rosaria, you could do the same. And do you, Rosaria, still have something you would like to bring up? Oh, no, but I, I just bring again the apologies of, 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 of Christian from the office of UNESCO Santiago. Um, he was very eager to, to, to be with you today and share the process they have been uh, leading with these youth consultations on sustainable development and education and global citizenship. But unfortunately, he had some last minute um, issues um, back in Chile, so he was not able to join. But definitely, um, if you have any question or if you would like to connect with them and to follow up the amazing work they are doing, we are um, happy to, to share uh, with them the, the information. So I'm gonna put my email on the chat as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you so much, all, all, all that that participated in this so yes. actively. So we're we're all grateful to to be having been the possibility to to join with this session. I hope you have a, a nice nice week and and summer. Thank you. Thank you.